brilliant. So everyone's very welcome tonight at our HerPlus data um, meetup session. Um, we have some um, some general um, guidance. Shall I? Are you going to flick through? That's it. Excellent. Um, so in terms of just um, how we uh, sort of conduct ourselves, it's around being um, kind to yourself and others. If you need to head off for anything, just feel free to do so. Um, Rachel's just mentioned that the event is being recorded and we'll share it uh, later via the YouTube channel. Um, turn on your video if you don't mind sharing your face, but equally feel free to have your video off if you feel comfortable. Um, and keep yourself muted so that we can um, minimize the background noise, especially for the speakers. Um, there's a, a chat um, box if you want to just um, feel free to ask any questions. Um, but if you wanted to ask any questions privately, you can message myself, Rachel or Mona. Um, and we ask that the Zoom room is not um, shared privately, uh, so publicly, sorry, so that we can just have um, a private function. So our code of conduct at Herplus Data, there is um, a full code of conduct that we can found on the meetup page, um, but we do not tolerate any harassment or bully bullying of any, um, of any kind. Um, and if you are being harassed or you notice that someone else is, you can um, ask for assistance from myself, Rachel or Mona. So our mission at HerPlus Data is to bring together women with a connection to data to provide a safe space where we can support and celebrate each other, share experiences and knowledge and establish meaningful connections and talk about data. Our organizers, um, so I'm Bernie, um, contract director over at um, Evolution. Um, we need to change this slide actually because um, Mona's had a promotion. Um, is it to strategy manager, Mona? Yeah, that's right. Excellent. And congratulations once again, Mona. Um, and then Rachel um, is community manager um, over at the University of Manchester. So the next three slides, I think, are, are pictures of sort of past events. Obviously, some of them are in person and the last few have, um, have been virtual. We, um, we started in September 2017, so and last month was our third birthday party, so quite a few of the um, last few events um, there in, in the photos. And we'll take a photo of this event shortly as well. So our events are normally on the second Thursday um, of every month, but our next event is on a Wednesday. So we have a gentleman um, called Brian Main, who's an expert in goal mapping, who's going to um, walk us through a masterclass on goal mapping. And we thought it was um, particularly relevant to do that in November and sort of people can think about what goals they have for, for 2021. Um, we're open and actively seeking collaboration on events um, that we can add to our normal meetup schedule. Um, and if you'd like to speak at an event or suggest a speaker um, or a theme or a topic or collaborate, more than welcome to, to hear those suggestions. These are ways um, to connect with us. And Thank you to Evolution, a uh, business that I work for, um, for continuing to, to support the group and the events. And also thank you to the Software Sustainability Institute for covering the cost of the meetup page. So our speakers this evening, we have Jane Theaker, who's the um, CEO of Canomica. Really sad to say that unfortunately, Bronwyn um, Pryor um, felt poorly earlier, so she's not going to be um, attending, but um, we've offered for her to record her talk and we would share it with the meetup group at a later date. And then Lorna Barkley, who's the lead healthcare analyst for Dr. Foster. And then I'll quickly interrupt Bernie uh, <laughs> to share some announcements. Um, so we are also working with Open Data Manchester in a few weeks to put on Data Horror Stories Night. So it's a, it's a fun event where you can come and share any tales of bad statistics, strange correlations, malicious intent, or just plain stupidity. Um, so if you have any um, bad data stories that you won't mind sharing, um, we'd love to hear them from you. So you can just ping me um, either in the chat or send me a message on Meetup and we can get you added to the lineup. You only have to talk for five minutes or less if you'd like, um, but we're really interested to hear these kind of stories in celebration of Halloween. 
Um, and then, as always, uh, we want to continue the conversation um, and momentum around the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so there's a Black Tech GoFundMe organized by Diverse and Equal Tech, um, who are uh, starting up some research and training initiatives um, to ensure that Black voices are heard and represented at every level of the tech industry. Um, so you can read more information and donate at the GoFundMe link um, there. And they are starting up their, their initiatives now. So um, also follow them along to see uh, their journey and, and how we can improve um, diversity in, in tech. So now, as uh, Brady mentioned, we like to take a group photo. So if you don't mind sharing your face, um, if you'd like to um, turn on your video for a second, and I'll just do a quick screenshot. But don't feel obligated if, if you're eating dinner or anything. Mm -hmm. All right, three, two, one. Thank you so much. Um, I try to keep that going, even though sometimes it's just a bunch of black squares. So I appreciate that. Um, and with that, I'll hand it back over to Bernie. Excellent. So um, if I can introduce Jane Thika as our first speaker. Um, Jane is the CEO over at Economica. So very welcome, Jane. Oh, thank you, Bernie. Well, um, at this point, I need to share my screen and I need to find the actual presentation that I should be sharing. Hang on a minute. Uh, so I share my screen, share. Right, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Brilliant, fantastic. That's always a positive when people can see it. <laughs> good, well, I was, good start. I was, yeah, good start. So I was asked um, uh, by um, Herplus Data to um, talk a little bit about maybe the company, what I do, a little bit about my journey or my career meanderings or any tips that I picked up as a woman in business and tech and I thought, well, I'll, I'll just tackle all three. It sounds like, a, you know, kind of a, a roller coaster ride in, in many respects. So um, first of all, about Economica. So we've got um, a really clear mission to be a world leader in cell signaling bioinformatics for precision medicine. Uh, and that's in research and also in diagnostics. So I'm just going to exemplify that by giving you one example of what's happening at the moment. And just so you can see where Economica's kind of unique selling point comes in. So the example I'm gonna give is, there's um, basically the current personalized medicine tests don't work particularly well. And the example I'm gonna give is of a, a drug called Midastorin, which is a launched drug on the market right now being used to treat acute myeloid leukemia. And whether you get that drug or not is, predicated on the results of a genetic test. And that test tests for mutations in the FLIP3 gene. Um, if you've got mutations in the FLIP3 gene, then you get the drug. If you haven't got mutations in the FLIP3 gene, then you don't get the drug, except it's a terrible test. It does exactly what it says on the tin. It tests for FLIP3 mutations and it does it very accurately, but it doesn't tell you whether you're gonna to respond to the drug or not. In fact, it's got a very low predictive value, uh, in fact, less than 50%. So you would be better off flipping a coin to decide whether you get mydostorin or not if you've got acute myeloid leukemia. And that's because um, mydostorin doesn't work at the level of the DNA, which is what the FLIP3 test tests for. It works at the level of the protein, specifically the activated proteins in a tissue. And we have um, a test um, called K-Scan, or a technology called K-Scan, I should say, which almost perfectly predicts for the drug eff efficacy. So it, it ranks the kinase activities or the protein activities in the tissue and gives you this almost perfect correlation with whether a drug is going to work or not before you've even given the drug to the patient. So what is this K-Scan technology that Economica have. Um, well, K-Scan is um, three things, actually. It's, it's a database, first of all. Um, it's a patented database that links together kinases, or these enzymes, and the substrates that they work on. So it's, it's, it's a relationship database. And then it's a set of um, machine learning algorithms that determine which kinases are actually enriched in the tissue that you're looking at. 
And when you put those two elements together, the database and the algorithms, it allows you to create a sort of leaderboard, if you like, of the kinase activities or the enzyme activities in the cell. And using this technology, as I've said, we can all, almost perfectly predict whether a, a patient's gonna to respond to a drug or not. And, and using this technique on the acute myeloid leukemia example that I gave you before, using K-Scan, we can more than double the predictive value of that test compared with the FLIT3 test. So that's, that's basically what Kinomica does. It predicts a lot better than genetic, current genetic tests do for drug efficacy or response to the drug. So where can you use this, this K-scan technology? Well, you can use it actually all the way from trying to identify what target um, a drug might work on um, through all the way through to clinical trials and the launch of the drug with a, a di diagnostic test that tells you whether you're gonna to respond to the drug or not, all the way along that um, pharmaceutical pipeline, if you like, um, right the way through mode of action studies, um, figuring out toxicological effects, you know, when you're getting nasty off-target effects, our technology can tell you why you're getting the, those off-target effects. And we can also um, personalize and stratify patients for particular clinical trials that might be of benefit to them. So this is really, you know, hugely valuable to the pharmaceutical industry. It, it saves them a, a ton of money and um, a, a ton of time and makes far better medicines for patients. And it also means that the healthcare providers aren't shelling out for medicines that don't work, um, which is the current situation. So that, that's a little bit about the, the, the kind of the technology. So how did I get to this position? Um, you know, what's my journey? How did I get here? Well, I just thought I'd, I'd run you through um, jobs that I've done in the past and what I learned from those jobs because every job you do you learn something new don't you so the first job I had was in the NHS and I worked there seven years as a biomedical scientist and I learned a huge amount about how diagnostic tests are used by doctors uh, and used to diagnose various diseases a huge range of techniques that became very useful later on in life and I also understood and, and learned that working 29 hour shifts was not very good for your health. Um, and that's that's what I did. Um, I did on call and 29 hour shifts at that time were common in the National Health Service. And I, and I realized, you know, doing that, I was going to be completely shattered every, all the time, basically. Um, but but also I, I managed to get a, an MSc um, in analytical uh, biochemistry out of that um, that job and that was very useful later on as well. Um, the next job I got was um, as a scientist at Zeneca Diagnostics and I worked there four years. And when I went there, I learned all about the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, so how to amplify or photocopy up DNA. And I also invented a new technology called Scorpion's primers, um, which later on was spun out uh, into a company that I later joined down here. Um, and, and that company was sold to Kyogen for 95 million. So that technology was actually hugely valuable. That invention was, was hugely valuable. Um, but I decided I wasn't gonna join that new spin out. I decided I would stay with the safe, comfy AstraZeneca job and have children. And um, whilst I was at AstraZeneca, I, I got to do some really amazing techniques like next generation sequencing, whole genome amplification, high throughput PCR, which is actually quite relevant with COVID on the horizon, um, and also looking at new technologies that might come in. So what I call horizon scanning. Um, I also did a course in Lean Six Sigma, which is incredibly useful and helped me to kind of view the world and the way I run the business now. And it also taught me how to spot change because um, AstraZeneca eventually closed down their facility at Aldley Park and uh, they did it in 2013 and I spotted that um, four years before because the pot plants went missing and I knew that they were basically on a downward trajectory on the site so that that was kind of how I figured that out. 
Um, and then uh, I, I moved to um, to Kyogen. I, I joined um, uh, DXS Kyogen, and I learned a huge amount about um, German industrialization and efficiency. And, and that really helped me in business later on to make sure that my businesses were incredibly efficient. Um, I also learned about team leadership and ISO 13485, which is the regulations that cover how to develop diagnostic tests to FDA standards. Um, again, a bit about horizon scanning, you know, new technology, what was on the horizon, how to write grants, and also a bit about business development as well. So that taught me a huge amount. And then I, I spent two years at um, LGC, or the laboratory, laboratory of the Government Chemist, um, learned a lot about the supply side to the diagnostics industries, and also about AgBio, and that was a completely new area to me. So AgBio, you know, seed industry, how do companies like Monsanto QC their seeds and make sure that they're doing the right thing in the field? Well, there's a whole scientific industry behind that, and that was incredibly interesting. Um, got to learn about really high throughput PCR technologies, you know, 75 million tests in a year, those sorts of volumes of tests and um, strategic marketing, how that can really drive a business and should drive a business. And then I formed my own consultancy after um, LGC and worked for a couple of years at a company called New Drive, which was looking at um, biosensor technology. Uh, and from that, I learned business development. I learned a bit about clinical trials. I also learned about um, getting VC investment, um, you know, equity investment and how to develop a really good pitch um, and, and also how to move labs. So when we were there, we, we had to move labs and that was quite a challenge in itself, but it was also valuable experience. And then at Kinomica, what have I learned there? Well, I'm still there, um, so still learning. Um, I've, I've learned about business development, uh, leadership, how to raise Series A money and how to move quickly. You know, when COVID happened, had to move in incredibly quickly to move our laboratory facilities up to Aldley Park from London where they had been based because all, all our labs were closed down because of COVID. So that was um, that was quite a challenge but you know it's, it's something that it teaches you something. So the last bit is a bit of kind of um, tongue-in-cheek really. Lessons I've learned as a woman in tech slash business and feel free to pitch in if you disagree with any of this, but hopefully it will bring a smile to your face as well. Um, so the first thing is getting married isn't a barrier to, to getting on in business, but children change everything. Um, I remember complaining early on that, you know, when I had kids, how, you know, how do you juggle it? And my mother just turned to me and said, Jane, women have been juggling things from time immemorial. Just get on with it. So, um, what I learned really was you need to find quite a supportive partner um, so, or, you know, somebody within your network or several people ideally in your network to help you to bring your kids up because sometimes you just can't be there and you need to make sure that your, your partner's going to be there or your mother-in-law is going to be there or your mother, whoever it is, try and build a supportive network around you because you're going to need it. Um, the next thing I would say is, and this is most important, get a cleaner because they are worth their weight in gold. And you know that feeling when you come back from, from work and the house is an absolute tip and all you just want to do is collapse. Well, it just makes you feel like your life is a bit more in control. So you can have it all, but I would say, make sure you've got a support network around you by getting a cleaner. Um, next thing is have conversations about boundaries. So I wanted to take a particular job and I knew um, really that traveling all the time wasn't going to be particularly great for family life. So my husband and I had a conversation about how much travel he could tolerate. And we came to this agreement that it would be 50 percent travel. So, OK, two and a half days a week, I, I can travel. That, that's fine um, because he can kind of juggle things in between. So that's what we stuck to. And we stuck to it rigidly for um, quite a few years. Um, and, and that just, you know, I, I made sure that I didn't overstep that boundary because I knew that was important to him. But it just meant that it gave me the flexibility that I needed 
to do stuff away from home. Um, and then the other thing that I used quite extensively was part-time working. So I worked a four day week when I was at Kyogen um, and I was an associate director there. And I can remember my boss coming to me and saying, um, how long is this part-time working gonna go on, Jane? And I just said to him forever, Jürgen, it's gonna go on forever because that's what I need. Um, so use part-time working as much as you can because um, it just allows you to kind of juggle your life a little bit. Um, and then the other thing is have a plan B. If you're stuck in traffic, somebody's got to pick up the children, make sure that there's somebody who can drop everything if you ring them up, pick up the kids just in case. So you need that plan B for every time, basically, because those times will happen. There will be some emergency that means that you have to be in the office or you have to be at a meeting and you just, or, you know, traffic's bad. And then this one I learned through really bitter experience. If you've got primary school age children, if you try and travel in October, it's a complete no-no because inevitably one of them will get sick. So um, I just, in the end, I just gave up trying to travel in, in October because I knew one of them was going to get sick and it just wasn't going to work. So expect kids to get sick in October. They go back to school in September, October hits, they get ill. And then um, this is a bit about, um, you know, your, your presence in the room. So, you know, just get used to being the only woman in the room. Make sure that you've got something of value to say. Um, you're probably going to have to muscle into the conversation because as a woman that just happens and you will have to endure mansplaining sometimes and also you'll have your idea recycled two minutes later as some someone else's brilliant idea so just get comfortable with it and don't get too defensive about it because it's going to happen so you might as well just get comfortable with it um, and then the other thing I would say has been really useful is try and learn something about Football, rugby, sailing, diving, rock climbing, motorcycling, Formula One. Not only because it's interesting, and it is quite interesting, but it acts as a bit of an icebreaker and a cultural integrator into the male psyche. So it means that you can always kick off a conversation by tapping into something that, um, you know, chaps might find interesting to talk about. And it just makes you a little bit less scary as a woman sometimes and just gets you integrated into that sort of cultural, um, uh, yeah, background if you like. And the other thing I would say, try and use teleconferencing as much as you can for, for three reasons. Number one, it means you can work from home and juggle the kids. Um, number two, it means that you're not constantly traveling and exhausted, and so you can get more out of your time. And number three, I think it gives you um, a slightly better presence than if, if you're in a face-to-face -face meeting and that's because you have to uh, maybe navigate the um the zoom meeting etiquette around who speaks first you know because you, you can't sort of cut across each other and also your physical presence is bigger on a screen you can you can be a bit more interactive and a bit of a bigger personality on screen than your physical presence i think in a meeting sometimes as a woman you can get overlooked just because you're smaller and I think uh, teleconferencing gets around that a little bit. Um, if you find a barrier, find a way around it and please don't be pigeonholed. Um, you know, you need to break out of those pigeonholes and those molds. Um, so quite often people don't think that you can talk about technical matters because you're a woman. Well, actually you can. You, you can hold your own on technical matters and, and be, prepared to plow your own, own furrow and prove that you're, you're right and that you're capable of doing something. And the last thing, the last tip is, you know, please pass on positive behaviours to other women and be supportive of all parents, men and women, because there are a lot of blokes out there as well who are, you know, supporting great women in the workplace. And, you know, we want to make sure that parents are supportive because bringing up children is hard. Um, and that's, that's it really. Um, any questions or thoughts thank you so much jane can we all just give a little bit of a virtual round of applause for jane oh thank you <laughs> i think you had some brilliant um advice and tips there i've got a question if i can mm -hmm. if i if i might um you mentioned um 
that you um, stayed in a role and you even said I stayed in the safe role when I had children with hindsight would you have done anything differently no because it was just it was just right for that time um, I could have joined the kind of less safe spin out but it would have been highly risky and I knew I was going to get pregnant mm. and I thought I can't do this to a new startup I respected the people I was going to work for and, and I thought if I get pregnant you know a year into working for them that's going to crucify that startup you know I'm one of three people there how on earth is that going to work out so I, I, I would rather they selected somebody who was completely committed to that spin out and that startup right from the get-go and, and I felt that if I was going to have kids I just couldn't do it couldn't do it and I couldn't do it to them so it was more out of respect for them and not wanting to kind of you know ham, hamstring the the business yeah yeah so it was my, they thought it, ahead yeah it was my decision not not theirs I mean I could have gone into it got pregnant and then said you're on your own guys you'll have to find a replacement for me for six months but I knew it would have killed them and it probably would have killed me. Yeah. So it was just a personal decision, but I think it is very personal, right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to weigh it up for yourself and think, well, okay, you know, maybe I should go into that role and give it a try. If you think you can manage it, then I think it's worth going for, definitely. A lot of what you said there about sort of managing life, managing children and all of all that comes with it just really resonated with me. I've definitely been in some of those situations like stuck in traffic. Ah, what are we going to do? Yeah, how are we going to pick up the kids? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's horrendous, isn't Calling it? Calling in a favour. Does anyone else have any questions for Jane? Well, while folks think of, of their questions, if they have any, I actually have one. So one of the um, tips you gave was, you know, you know, expect to be the only woman in the room and to find these icebreaker topics to, to kind of, you know, or, you know, talk about football or learn more about um, Formula One and stuff. I was just curious, have any of your male counterparts tried to do like the reverse? Have they tried to, you know, maybe think or like invest in, you know, learning more about maybe a stereotypical woman's topic and, and trying to like approach you that way? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's um, no, it just never happens. And um, it, it's it's quite. Yeah, that's quite telling, really. The nearest they'll come to it is, oh, have you got children? Because they have children. Right. So that's something they can talk about it. But um, no, that, that doesn't happen the other way. Yeah, because my initial reaction when you were suggesting that was just like, um, I don't know, because I don't think that would go the other way around. But um, no, I do find that interesting because um, I've done it on a more personal level, you know, to, yeah. with with friends and stuff. So why wouldn't I do that in a more professional setting? But I my gut, my initial reaction was just like, mm, I don't know. But I do find that really, really interesting and telling. It, it's it's a, a way in, isn't it? It's a way in to start a conversation as an icebreaker um but it doesn't happen the other way nobody says oh has anybody taken up crochet what do you think or you know <laughs> how about you know some great novel that somebody's written that's kind of a typical chick lit kind of novel you know it, it just just doesn't happen that way um which just tells you there's a bit of a patriarchy going on doesn't it a bit. it did make me chuckle a bit when you made that comment because I've just had the rules of football and rugby and cricket and baseball explained to me so many times in a work context and I now rebel against it like I know it's probably would be nice to try and get my head around it and be able to talk about it but I just switch off whenever anyone tries to talk about it well one, one way to get a conversation going is definitely to say can you just explain the offside rule in football to me and, and that you know you'll get everybody wading in it'll be fantastic you'll get you know, but it makes you just a little bit more approachable is what I'm saying. It makes you that person that they can actually talk to because you're slightly interested in what they do. And you're not this kind of foreign person. If you're the only woman in the room, you will be feeling isolated and you have to somehow break down those barriers and make yourself more approachable is what I think. 
Uh, and I'll just say I really like rock climbing and football, just for the record. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sometimes it's interesting, yeah. Yeah. The or, Formula yeah, One. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, the Formula One documentary on Netflix is genuinely very good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There is some interesting stuff there that you think, oh, yeah, I can get into that myself for its own, you know, intellectual value. Well, <laughs> maybe not so much the intellectual, but yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of science in Formula One, I will oh, say. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Engines. And, and anybody who's watched the film Moneyball will see that there's a lot of um, interesting data in sport, actually. Yeah. So, yeah. Excellent. So is that, do we think that's all questions for, for Jane? And if so, let's just give her another round of applause. So thank you very much, Jane. Thank you. You've been really interesting welcoming. talk. Thank you ever so much. Um, so now we have um, Lorna. Do you want Hi. me to, are you okay with your slides, Lorna? You sent them to me earlier. Yeah. I'll just try and share my screen. Hopefully that will work. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, can you see that okay? Yeah, we can all see it. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, lovely, Lorna. Okay, perfect. I can't see anyone now, but that's fine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thanks for thanks for asking me to speak. Um, I guess I'm maybe the only person based in London at the moment, but um, yeah, I'm I'm based in London and I work for a company called Dr. Foster, and I'm a lead healthcare analyst there. Um, and in this talk, I guess I really just want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Foster, the company I work for. Um, and then I was going to go into um, a particular project um, that I've really enjoyed working on and um, kind of involving machine learning um, to help stratify patients for population health. Um, so I guess just to give you brief background about myself. So um, my background is in statistics. I uh, studied mathematics and statistics and did a PhD in statistics at Warwick um, and then worked as a data scientist for several years. Um, first at a company called Dunhumby, which some of you might know as the inventor of the Tesco club card. Um, and then later I moved to um, IQVIA as well, um, healthcare company um, as a data scientist. And I really sort of became interested in healthcare through my degree um, as my, my PhD was quite a theoretical statistics um, PhD but I applied my work to some sort of small healthcare data sets and then having worked in data science for a number of years I then was just really keen to move into healthcare and sort of apply what I'd learned in data science to a sector that I'm really passionate about and feel that I can sort of make a difference. Um, so I feel quite lucky to have moved to Dr. Foster's. We we work a lot kind of with the NHS um, to improve patient outcomes. Um, and I am generally responsible for the kind of statistical machine learning projects within the company. So um, it's a great combination of the two and a very interesting role. Hey, Lorna, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, Oh, can never mind. I was, I, no, I can hear you. I, I wasn't sure if um, you were advancing slides or not, if you were in present mode. Never mind. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll move. Sorry. I do like, I'll move into present mode. Is that better? Perfect. Sorry about that. No, no, not at all. Um, so yeah, just to tell you a little bit about Dr. Foster. So Dr. Foster was founded um, just over 20 years ago um, and since 2015 has been part of Telstra Health, um, which is Australia's largest health and technology um, and software company. And Dr. Foster really forms the UK division um, of Telstra Health. And Dr. Foster is a leading provider of healthcare analysis and clinical benchmarking in the UK. So we work 
um, mainly with the NHS and um, we work with numerous NHS organisations from hospital providers and trusts and um, commissioners, GP practices, GP federations or national NHS bodies. Um, and our aim is really to use data and use analytics to deliver insights um, to healthcare organisations and help them plan their services and make better decisions and I guess ultimately improve, improve patient outcomes. Um, so the team um, that, I, that I lead is um, Dr. Foster Analytics team. So I guess Dr. Foster in general, um, we're a reasonably small company, about 60 people, um, and we're a mix of data engineers and app developers, healthcare experts, um, consultants and analysts. Um, and I'm one of the leads within the analytics team. Um, so our backgrounds um, are quite varied um, within healthcare analysis, statistics or data science. Um, and we really work within kind of the area of using data analytics and um, building algorithms or applying machine learning techniques um, to derive insights. Um, and we're, we're lucky that we, we get to work very closely with everyone else across the business. We sort of kind of sit um, in the center of the business. And um, what I always find very interesting is we work, for example, very closely with some of the health care professionals. So there's trained clinicians and nurses within the company who have worked in the NHS and really understand sort of the pressures and challenges sort of from real life experience. Um, so we work very closely um, with them. Um, but then also we, we get the chance to work more with the data engineers to um, take the national data healthcare data sets um, for us and process them. Um, and then we also work with the um, application development experts and technology teams to be able to surface, I guess, our, our dashboards and insights um, back to the customer. So I guess before I um, tell you about the, the project that I mentioned at the beginning, um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the um, sort of work we do within the team. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, Dr. Foster is historically known for its hospital benchmarking. So this means that we create risk adjusted metrics um, that allow us um, to benchmark hospitals and allow them to compare themselves nationally and to peers and um, taking into account patient case mix. Um, and this really allows them to identify potential um, safety alerts or areas of improvement. Um, another big sort of focus for us um, over the last six months has, has been COVID. Um, so we've really sort of pivoted a little bit and really focused on supporting trusts to analyse um, their COVID data. Um, so we've been working with trusts and taking their local COVID data and have analysed the effect of different um, patient demographics and different risk factors and how these um, are affecting COVID admissions um, and COVID mortality. Um, and this has been really interesting work um, for us and has been has felt very valuable to be able to I guess provide trust with an understanding of the patients that they're seeing kind of at this time and potentially also to help them prepare for a potential um, second wave as well. Um, then another focus um, at Dr. Foster is really around population health. So a lot of the hospital benchmarking and the COVID work that we're doing really focuses on the trusts and the hospitals and the secondary care data that we receive. Um, but when we're looking at population health, um, we link this data to primary care data, so to data um, that from the GPs um, to be able to um, really provide sort of an understanding of the pathway of patients and, and outcomes for individual people and populations. And very closely linked to this is the area I want to talk a little bit more about um, today within predictive analytics. Um, 
So here we're really using this sort of rich data set of linked primary and secondary care data um, to be able to predict um, the risk of adverse outcomes and stratify patients into meaningful groups um, to allow for patient level identification and also um, potential intervention, which I will describe a little bit more um, in a minute. So um, in terms of the predictive analytics um, part of Dr. Foster, so the purpose of this is really to support NHS organisations to identify potential future risks and challenges early and be able to address these ahead of time. So examples of this could be, for example, predicting the risk of an emergency admission in the next 12 months. Um, or predicting the risk of an admission due to a specific condition, um, such as diabetes or COPD or COVID, um, or, for example, predicting the risk of falls. And the aim is really to um, say for predicting the risk of falls, potentially if, if we could work with GPs and predict um, which patients are at higher risk of falls, potentially these patients could benefit from a more targeted approach, potentially they would benefit from strength and balance classes, which would um, reduce their risk of falling um, and reduce the risk of a potential um, hospital um, admission. Um, that could be quite costly as well. Um, so it's really, I guess, um, providing these predictive models to really provide insights into future performance and outcomes and see what can be done to kind of prevent some of these outcomes. And I've just described here um, on the right the kind of process that we take. So as I mentioned, we work with primary and secondary care data. We will train um, an algorithm to create a model and then we'll work with the trust or um, CCG um, or GP practice um, to, if they give us new data, to apply the model to this data and, and give back to them patient level risk scores and these risk scores can then kind of feed into insights for them and um, so in some cases we might provide these back at the patient level or we might aggregate them up into higher level risk groups and um, to provide system level insights um, so that's kind of the general process that we would apply um, so I just wanted to go through um, a particular case study that I've been working on. So um, this is um, a model that we have developed um, for Lambeth GP federations. And the model um, identifies patients with a risk of having an emergency admission in the next 12 months. Um, and I guess in terms of the, the process that we take around this, so this I guess, as with every machine learning problem, sort of a feature engineering step, um, a modeling step, and then I guess the results section. So I just briefly wanted to go through each of these um, and I guess explain how, how we developed this model um, for the GP federations. So in terms of the feature engineering um, listed this subset of the, the variables that we looked into um, on the right. So we um, included demographic variables such as age, gender and deprivation. We also included a number of um, service use variables. So how many GP appointments has the patient had over the last year or the last two years? How many previous emergency admissions have they had? Um, how long have they waited in A&E in total um, over the last year and so on. But we've also included a number of um, clinical variables. And this is also, I guess, where primary care data has come in really useful. Um, so we, for example, um, created flags for numerous conditions that the patient um, could have. We've looked at um, including the number of medications that patient is on and um, their frailty score and um, but then also in secondary care data looking at um, previous procedures that they've had and um, distinct diagnosis of various clinical groupings 
And then using a machine learning approach, we kind of iteratively identified the features that are the most relevant. So we started off, I think, with around 150 features over different time periods um, and different data sets and sort of um, reduced those iteratively over time to come up um, with the best performing model. So in terms of the algorithm that we used, so um, we used a machine learning algorithm called gradient boosted trees. So this is um, a tree based algorithm which constructs multiple trees based on subsets of data. Um, but unlike algorithms such as random forests, rather than creating a number of decision trees and averaging them, um, the algorithm with each iteration attempts to correct the errors from previous iterations. So it's continuously improving the overall accuracy of the model. Um, and this algorithm has, has shown to be um, quite widely used and also um, quite powerful um, at predictions. And from our aspect, um, the reason this was really relevant is because um, we looked at a number of factors and using this algorithm, we kind of found a data-driven approach um, to identify the most relevant factors. Um, and I've listed here below, you can see that um, based on the algorithm that we built, it was actually a number of distinct diagnoses and number of unique medications that seemed to be kind of the most relevant for the predictions, followed by previous emergency admissions and age, um, as you'd maybe expect. Um, I guess one thing that I should mention is that there are um, existing algorithms um, for predicting emergency admissions as well. They're um, historically um, built on probably less features um, and not using machine learning approaches. And they often assume particular sort of categories of variables um, in advance. So they might be including a variable saying, does the patient have more than three admissions in the last year? And again, this is where our algorithm came in really useful because these sort of this sort of categorization um, was not necessary and was actually um, identified through the algorithm as well. And that proved to be really useful. So just finally, um, I wanted to show you a few results around the model. So as I mentioned, um, there's what I've called here traditional approach there. Are, we compared our model to um, a well-known existing algorithm around this. Um, and in terms of the model performance, um, we looked at the area under the rock curve and we could see that we, we were able to get a slight improvement in terms of performance with our model. Um, but perhaps more interestingly, we also, um, on the validation set, looked at the patients and said, OK, let's choose the top 0.5% of patients that we've given the highest risk score and then see how many of these patients actually get admitted. And using the kind of old approach, around 62.8% were actually admitted, whereas for our model, it was high, around 65%. Um, so we are sort of slightly better at predicting this high risk group and the same for the next highest risk group. But then interestingly, sort of looking at the patients that were assigned a low score according to the model, again, we could see that actually 2.7% were admitted according to the old approach and 2.4% with our model. So we were able to get um, a full kind of improvement across the full kind of population which was very important to us. We didn't just want to get better at kind of predicting the high risk, but we wanted to make sure that we kind of have improved predictions overall. Um, and then finally, just um, to explain this plot here. So one of the sort of criticisms, I guess, of machine learning algorithms um, is often that it's quite hard to understand exactly how the algorithm works. It's a bit unclear how we come up with certain predictions. Um, and I think especially sort of in healthcare, if you're predicting something like the risk of an emergency admission, 
you, you want to be able to provide this kind of explanation of, okay, why, why does a particular patient have this particular risk score? Does this seem sensible? Um, and again, what was quite useful with the algorithm that we used is that we are actually able to kind of unpick exactly how each patient goes through each of these decision trees and unpick exactly how each of the features included in the model are contributing to a particular patient risk. So we can see here, for example, that in total in this example population, 7% of um, the total risk of an emergency admission is 7%. But then we have a particular patient who has a higher risk of 22%. And then we can see directly, okay, it's, it's the fact that it's an elderly patient um, with a medium frailty score, which is increasing the risk. But then the patient is only on two unique medications and hasn't had any outpatient appointments. So this kind of reduces the risk again. Um, and I think this has been um, really powerful as well when kind of showing um, this type of analysis to customers because we're able to sort of pick out patients and really explain that what the model is doing um, is, is sensible. So that, that was, I guess, everything I really wanted to, to talk about. Um, so yeah, if you, if you do have any questions, um, about Dr. Foster or about um, this particular work, then do let me know. Thank you so much, Lorna. That was really interesting. Thank you. Can we give Lorna a virtual round of applause as well, please? Thank you. And Jane, I noticed you had a, a question and you posted that. Would you, would you like to read it out or I can? Yeah, I can read it out. Um, well, basically, do you have access to the pathology records as well as the primary and secondary data there, Lorna? Um, no, not in not in that setting. So I guess would only be um, the primary care sort of GP data, and then in secondary care we work with um, the HES data, so with the administrative data set. Okay, because um, I know uh, in Manchester, because of COVID and because of sharing of data, they've got now access to all of the. Um, pathology records basically all of the sort of primary data in the Manchester area so that that could be an absolutely huge repository there it's all anonymized you, you don't get to see sort of um, patient level data uh, mm. but, but that could be an absolutely fantastic resource to do some yeah. you know really in-depth research there yeah yeah definitely I mean I think getting the necessary data sets is definitely something I guess another one is um community care data sets mental health data sets. I guess all of that if you were able to link that at patient level then obviously the predictions that you can make are going to be so much more more accurate um, and valuable um, but I guess unfortunately we're always limited um by the data that we can actually we can actually get um we have actually been doing some work around seeing if we could do similar analysis only using the GP data, because quite often even the secondary care data won't necessarily be available. So we're trying to look into, well, if we just work with GP data, can we still get a good prediction of, um, of hospital admissions? But, yeah, same reason. Uh, how, do you, how do you get hold of that data? Do you have sort of... Um... Is this on the basis that you're going to provide useful insights back to, yeah. uh, to right? Okay, so it's it's given freely, but then the insights are coming back to them to be able to make, um, you know, better decision making for patient benefit. Yeah, so it will be on a on a quantum. So for these this type of work, where we're linking primary and secondary care data. It will be that we're working with the GP Federation or CCGs to kind of. Um, take their local data and then we, we provide the analysis back to them in in a risk stratification tool or similar. Interesting. And I'll just ask um, uh, Lorna, um, thanks very much, really good presentation. Um, really interested in machine learning, I'm a data analyst as well in the field of health. I'm just wondering um, what tools you use to apply it. Um, you talked about you know the actual um, type of machine learning. Are you doing that in Python or 
Um, we actually did this in R. So a lot oh, of the okay. kind of initial data manipulation was in SQL, and then yeah. we we did the analysis in R. Um, okay. I guess we could have used Python, but at yeah. the time we were more used to R, so that's yeah, what we sure. went with. Um, okay. I might be coming back to this for some code at some point then. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any other questions for, for Lorna? No. Okay, lovely. Well, thank you so much then to, to Jane and Lorna, our speakers. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Bronwyn wasn't able to, to join us, so um, we'll, we'll ask her if she does want to record her talk and um, send it out on the, on the meetup as well. So thank you ever so much for tonight's speakers. Brilliant. Thank you.